Hello, Game Boys and Game Girls. I'm the Game Boy Guru, and welcome to episode 25 of... Dramatic Readings! In this series, you get to watch footage of me playing a Game Boy game while I fill your ear holes with knowledge and opinion about said game. This time around, we take a look at a game that is, in my opinion, a bona fide classic, but may not necessarily have got its due, either back in the day when it was released, or even now, it may sometimes be overlooked. But yet, in the Game Boy canon, it is one of the greats. It's Metroid 2, Return of Samus. In the annals of video game history, some games don't quite get their due. For every Super Mario Brothers that gets duly recognized for its greatness, there's bound to be a couple games that, while perhaps not as ubiquitous or universally appealing, they are nearly as well designed and realized. While commercial fortunes may elude said games, sometimes their critical acclaim transcends the almighty dollar, and a game's fortunes can be won more organically through the slow burn that comes from word of mouth. When this kind of grassroots movement starts to take hold, it's only a matter of time before someone takes notice. Such is the case with the original Metroid, which was of particular interest to the youth in North America. Much like its adventure game Forbear, The Legend of Zelda, which released a mere month prior in the US, Metroid became the talk of school playgrounds across the country. Kids were talking about the exploration, the cool main character, and how hard the game was, because there was nothing telling you where to go or what to do. There was an air of mystery surrounding the character of Samus, and a sense of loneliness that comes from a game with no humanoid enemies and only a scant few alien foes to dispatch here and there, with no clear indication of why you should do so, if only because they will hurt you otherwise. It was as if the Wild West had been recreated on an alien planet, and Samus was the lone homesteader, trying to get lay of the land. Metroid was a revelation in console game design. While The Legend of Zelda had a sprawling map and immediate sense of adventure, with its jaunty overworld theme and colorful graphics, Metroid immediately set out on a different path, with a darker overall feel, and elements heavily inspired by artist H.R. Giger and the Alien film by Ridley Scott. Samus, the game's protagonist, was alone on an alien world, with a limited arsenal of weaponry to defend herself from a myriad of threats. The stark, black background and unfamiliar terrain helped to define the game's atmosphere, which gave the original Metroid a sense of identity. This identity paved the way for a series of games that, while having achieved notoriety, hasn't quite reached the accolades it deserves. After the modest success of the original game, Nintendo followed it up with a sequel in an unlikely place on their handheld Game Boy system. After the very open, exploratory nature of Metroid graced the Famicom and the NES, Gunpei Yokoi and a small development team were given the opportunity to create a follow-up. What we got in the sequel was a bit more straightforward than its predecessor, with less backtracking, more combat, and a few elements that have since become staples of the franchise. How the sequel stacks up against its predecessor, and the games that followed, is up for debate. The short version of the story synopsis is, after defeating the Mother Brain in the first game, the Galactic Federation sends Samus on a mission to the Metroid Lifeform's homeworld, designated SR-388, to wipe out the species. After landing on the planet, Samus must set out to find and destroy all remaining Metroids. Along the way, she discovers that this life form has various states of evolution, and some of the more evolved forms are particularly nasty and difficult to dispatch. Once she has successfully expunged all Metroids from SR-388, she must then face off with the Metroid Queen. Assuming she can take out the mother of all Metroids, Samus can consider it a day's work and return home. There are a number of changes to the Metroid formula that are obvious here. 
such as the move from console to handheld, the necessary change to four monochrome shades instead of color, and the zoomed-in perspective, complete with large Samus sprite, because of the small screen size and lower resolution of the Game Boy. Some changes are only obvious once you begin to play the game. This is a more linear affair than the original game. Sure, you can backtrack as far as you want or need, but unless you miss a path, don't follow a path completely, or want to go back to save your game or replenish health or missiles, it's not nearly as essential to revisit the areas you've explored before. Also, unlike the original, this time Samus starts out with some abilities already enabled, such as the Morph Ball. She also starts out with a stock of missiles, which are necessary to kill the Metroids. As you make your way through the game, you quickly find the Spider Ball power-up, which allows you to make the Morph Ball form adhere to any surface, as if by using some kind of sticky substance. This is essential for traversing various areas, and for reaching the locations of some power-ups and Metroids. In addition, you'll locate missile upgrades, each increasing the maximum number of missiles you can carry by five. You'll find the familiar Ice Beam and Wave Beam part of the way through, but you'll also discover the new Spacer Beam and Plasma Beam, both of which return later in Super Metroid. As with the original game, you can find the Varia Suit to cut the damage Samus takes in half, as well as obtain the Screw Attack, which allows Samus to cause damage to enemies when jumping into them in a spinning motion. New to this outing are the High Jump Boots, which allow Samus to jump far higher than normal, as well as the Space Jump, which allows Samus to essentially spin jump infinitely, assuming subsequent jumps are executed properly. More on that later. There's also a Spring Ball power-up obtained by conquering a creature known as an Arachnus that allows Samus to jump while in Morph Ball form. Items that are essential to the completion of the game are the Spider Ball, the Ice Beam, and the Space Jump. To make life easier, the Screw Attack is really helpful, and of course, locating as many energy tanks to increase Samus's total health points and missile tanks as possible, so you have enough ammo to take out the more highly evolved Metroids. You also probably won't get too far if you don't upgrade to a more powerful gun, such as the Plasma Beam, at some point during the adventure. Because this is a more linear affair, chances are you'll likely discover most of the upgrades with minimal exploration and effort, as nothing in the game is too far off the beaten path. It's just a matter of looking at the fairly obvious tells for where to bomb or shoot, to break a path through a wall or floor, and you'll find what you're looking for. Graphically, this game is really on point. The Samus sprite is large and detailed, and despite limited frames of animation, looks great while running and performing various movements. All the areas are nicely drawn, with interesting use of different patterns and motifs that tie together fairly well, without being too repetitive. Enemies all look good, though most aren't really animated. It's a bit odd, as most enemy sprites just move on screen, but don't have separate frames of animation. One particular enemy that does has a weird effect that accompanies the animation. I don't know if this was a conscious decision to help minimize screen blurring, or to keep the focus on Samus's animation, but it's an interesting side note. Of particular interest is the colorization option available when playing the game on newer hardware. Starting with the Super Game Boy, and going all the way up through the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Player, each official way to play the Metroid 2 cartridge was programmed with a specific color palette for the game that gave Samus her iconic red and yellow suit and colorizes backgrounds and foreground elements in various ways. I know there's some hardware trickery that can be used to sort of get around the four shade limitation with this special palette, though I'm not entirely sure how Nintendo pulled it off. I think the palette was tweaked after the Super Game Boy for the Game Boy Color and for the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Player. As I played the game on two different CRT TVs, the Super Game Boy palette looks brighter and more limited in terms of colors used, whereas playing on the Game Boy Player, which I did for my initial full playthrough, 
It seems there's a wider array of color choices used, suggesting that Nintendo purposely used some additional Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance magic to accomplish that. In the audio department, the game is pretty much what you would expect, and that's mostly a good thing. The music in the game is a mixture of slightly bouncy, hopeful sci-fi adventure music, ambient sounds, and a couple tunes that are less hopeful and more foreboding, though nothing quite as atmospheric as the follow-up game would have, save perhaps for the title screen theme, with its contrasting harsh, high-pitched tones and somber melody. The iconic jingle that plays when you find an upgrade is here, complete with a couple nice percussive flourishes for effect. The theme that plays during the final face-off with the Metroid Queen is sufficiently dark and unique as well. Sound effects are mostly good, with cool explosion effects, good weapon noises, and a scant few enemy sounds. The one area of sound I, that I take issue with is the annoying alarm that plays constantly when you get low on health. It's kind of cool that it changes a little bit, depending on how close you are to death or to restoring your health, but it's still annoying. It's not quite as grating as that of most of the Legend of Zelda series games, and yet remains a nuisance. Going into this game, expecting an experience like the original game is a mistake, so if perchance you haven't played this game yet, understand that it takes a different approach. The goal here is to kill all 39 Metroid creatures on SR388, and then take out the Queen. As I mentioned earlier, this is a far more linear affair. When you pause the game, you see a number in the lower right corner, which indicates the number of Metroids you have to kill within the general area. Once that counter reaches zero, you experience a mild earthquake, and the acid that blocks your path to lower areas of the planet gets reduced, which then allows you to go deeper into SR388 to find and destroy more Metroids. After this acid reduction takes place and you move to the next area, you can pause the game again and see how many Metroids are in that area you need to dispatch. Unlike the original game, which saw you exploring large areas with no major threats, save for a few pesky enemies here and there, this game has what boils down to a succession of mini-boss fights with many of the lower-tiered Metroids. This approach quickly becomes full-on boss fights, as you face off with some of the more evolved forms that take more of a pelting to down and are trickier to defeat. A quick search of the web will reveal the strategy for fighting the Queen, but if you go in blind, like I did, you may be a little stumped as to how to take her down, even with full health and missiles. After defeating the Queen, instead of having to quickly escape, you can sort of leisurely stroll out of her chamber and jump your way up through the catacombs to reach the surface again so you can get back to your ship. As you do so, you'll encounter an egg, which hatches, and reveals a baby Metroid that follows you. As you're escaping, this baby Metroid will clear a path for you through certain obstacles that Samus cannot shoot through, either with a laser weapon or with missiles. This, of course, sets the stage for the iconic Super Metroid intro, with its famous line, the last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. So unlike the Legend of Zelda franchise, which has rarely received a direct sequel from one game to another, the stories of the first three games in this series are all interconnected, and flow relatively well from the first through the third. When I initially wrote this review in the fall of 2017, I noted how it was interesting that there are now more options than ever to experience the story and gameplay of Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Not only can you purchase an original cart and play on some form of Game Boy hardware, but you can also purchase the game on the 3DS eShop. The game never received a Wii or Wii U Virtual Console release, however. In August 2016, a fan remake was released, known on the web as AM2R, which stands for Another Metroid 2 Remake, which was released as a free download for PC. Within days, Nintendo rightfully filed DMCA takedown requests to protect the Metroid series as their intellectual property, and the game was subsequently taken down. This happened after the developer, using the name Dr. M64, had poured years of development time into the project. 
Of course, as with anything on the internet these days, once it's out in the wild and a few people have downloaded it, it's still generally available, though not officially from the AM2R weblog. Subsequently, Dr. M64 has parlayed his notoriety into a job offer from New Moon Studios, who developed Ori and the Blind Forest, so at least the good doctor landed on two feet after this went down. In addition, Nintendo released an official remake titled Metroid Samus Returns. This remake adds new elements, such as a melee parry ability, which gives you the ability to stun incoming enemies so you can then target them with a new laser sight and blast away. I haven't purchased a copy yet, but after playing through the original, it's on my list to buy and play through at some point. Without getting too far down into the weeds, AM2R is a worthy remake, and definitely worth checking out. It fixes many of the typically mentioned problems with the original game. It's in full color, the perspective is zoomed out, the control is tighter, the game moves faster, and there's a greater sense of exploration because some of the new abilities you have to find first, such as the spider ball. I haven't played it through to completion, but I can say that it definitely feels more like Super Metroid, and that's a good thing. The interpretations of the Metroid 2 music are all really well done, and worth downloading on their own, as they tend toward the Super Metroid style and overall feel. Graphically, AM2R is gorgeous, with that Super Nintendo look and feel, and the game is impressive overall. Yes, you'll need to look a little harder to find a download for it, but it will be worth your time, because it's a stunning game that takes the source material and lovingly updates it to give it more polish. I can't really recommend it enough, given the fact that it's free. Now that I've sung the praises of the fan remake, how does the original game fare? Pretty well, all things considered. The game looks and sounds great. Metroid 2 retains some of the lonely feeling of the first game, but without too jarring an effect when you find a Metroid to take out. Each area where a Metroid is located, you'll see a shattered egg or pod, indicating that there's one close by, so you'll be on heightened alert. Each time you clear an area of Metroids, it's a very satisfying feeling, knowing you've opened up a whole new area to explore. The new weapons and items are cool, and you'll definitely have fun with the spider ball power-up, scaling walls and going all sorts of places, looking for energy tanks and missile upgrades. The Metroid encounters, especially the more evolved forms, can get fairly intense, and will raise your heart rate significantly as you rush to pelt them with missiles. The game isn't without flaws, however. The obvious issue of the zoomed-in perspective, due to the Game Boy's low resolution, is present here. It doesn't affect gameplay too much, but it does hamper the Metroid encounters somewhat, because there's so little room to maneuver, it can feel claustrophobic for some of them. The Game Boy's processor speed is a factor, because it means that the game moves a bit more slowly than its predecessor. That's not entirely a bad thing, because it makes some of the Metroid encounters a touch easier, but on the flip side, that means the game isn't overly difficult. As with the first game in the series, Metroid 2 has no map feature, so you'll either need to draw your own, or in this age of internet, just search for one. I found one that I liked, and used that as my guide throughout the game. Even though this is a more linear adventure than the original, I still recommend using or creating a map. I also rather dislike when games have zero recovery time when you take damage. Yes, I know that with the energy tanks, it's more forgiving than a game where you get three to five hits and you're dead, but you can quickly run out of life in some situations. Add to this the fact that this game has knockback, and there are a couple of spots where you can be juggled to death by a pair of adjacent enemies with no way to escape. You can get knocked off a ledge by a Metroid, only to fall into an acid pit or other hazard and quickly drain all your health. Metroids can be difficult to kill because they're only vulnerable in certain spots, and some of the more evolved forms are hard to evade as you're attacking, so you will inevitably take damage and often be forced to backtrack to find a health refill station before you will feel brave enough to venture to the next Metroid chamber, lest you find a safe point before then. The Metroids toward the end of the game can only be killed by using the Ice Beam to freeze them, 
and then quickly pelt them with five missiles before they thaw out. If you don't know this, you'll die repeatedly until you figure it out. And even then, you'll find that once they get to you and get on top of you, they'll drain your health really fast, and you'll have to flail around frantically to shake them off. I understand that increases the sense of urgency in dealing with them and taking them out, but when you're so close to the end, it can be very frustrating to be downed so easily by what essentially looks like a flying jellyfish. And finally, the space jump. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I have a hard time pulling it off in successive jumps. I don't know if I'm waiting too long or what my problem is, but in some areas where it's easier and faster to use the space jump, or in locations where you have to because there are hazards that prevent you from using the spider ball, I found myself easily frustrated because I couldn't pull it off easily. I would get it to work two or three times, only to stop spinning and fall to the ground below. Or I would start using it and try to time it so that I could dodge enemies and enemy fire, only to plow right into a hazard and plummet back down below. It wasn't enough to make me want to rage quit, but it certainly raised my blood pressure and put a damper on the overall experience. I know there are folks who can space jump like nobody's business, and kudos to them. I obviously haven't quite reached the level of space jump Zen Master. When it's all said and done, I believe that Metroid 2 Return of Samus is still well worth playing more than 25 years after its release. It's still a solid game that holds up well, and won't take an exorbitant amount of time to get through. The mechanics, graphics, music, sound, and gameplay all hold up well enough to make it worth going back to. I will say that if you're curious about AM2R or Metroid Samus Returns, I would encourage you to go back and play the original first, even if just briefly through emulation, so that you have a greater appreciation for the remake and reimagining of the game, and also to see that despite the improvements introduced in these newer iterations, the core gameplay is essentially the same and is still strong all these years later. Metroid 2 Return of Samus remains one of the shining examples of how to take a beloved console game franchise and shrink it down to a mobile platform and still make it work in a way that is fun, engaging, and worthwhile. Despite its flaws, I still had a lot of fun with the game and would definitely revisit it in its original form, even with the availability of remakes. Highly recommended, if not downright essential, for Game Boy enthusiasts and Metroid fans alike. And there you have it, my friends. Metroid 2 Return of Samus on the Game Boy. A bona fide classic and a game that, as I revisited recently to record footage for and having played through a couple of times, I realized just how impressive it is on the original Game Boy and especially on the Super Game Boy and subsequent Game Boy hardware generations. Thank you to everyone who has been patient waiting for this new episode of Dramatic Readings after uh, such a long absence from this uh, video series and making these episodes because I finally have my recording set up, figured out, uh, and able to hopefully be able to do the series justice the way that I've wanted to do since the beginning. And speaking of which, if you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing so you can see more of my videos in your YouTube feed. I'll have a link in the description below to the original written review that this video is based upon, as well as to the rest of my blog where you can read all my Game Boy reviews. That is GameBoyGuru.blogspot.com. Also, make sure you go check out Nira and his channel. He provided the Super Mario Land overworld music that I use as the intro for many of my videos, and he does a bunch of other great chiptune and game music covers as well, so please go check those out. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and game on.